Okay, we're going to do an answer key for the test review worksheet and post it for you guys so that if you're at home, you know how to do the test review. So problem number one says, what is a possible measurement for angle T? Explain your answer. Well, this was in our 6.3 notes, and it was called the hinge theorem. And when that states that when I have two triangles who have two congruent sides, so that means we have PT is congruent to AE. We also have TR congruent to EC. But the angle included between those two triangles is different. You can see this one's a lot bigger angle. And the side opposite is bigger. And we know that from our previous chapters that that's a true theorem. So on this one, the opposite side is 5, which means this angle has to be smaller than 121. So if we're trying to say what is a possible measurement for angle T, it could be anything less than 121. So I'm going to write angle T has to be less than 121 degrees. It also has to be bigger than 0. We can't have an angle that's 0. All right, 2. What is the possible side length for SP? So if we look here, it's the same thing, the hinge theorem. We have this side congruent to this side, and we have this side congruent to this side. The angle between those two is different. This one's 108, and this one's 68. So this side must be bigger than this side. And since this one is 7, it can be anything bigger than 7. So we would put SP has to be greater than 7. Okay, number 3 says list the five congruency theorems that can be used to prove two triangles are congruent. So we have side, side, side. We have side, angle, side. We have angle, angle, side. Angle, side, angle. That one's my favorite because it has to do with softball. Then our last one is hypotenuse, leg. That's the one that has to do with right triangle theorems. Okay, number four and five it says transform each given triangle on the coordinate plane as described and label the coordinates of the image. So we have to rotate triangle M and P 180 degrees counterclockwise about the origin. So if you remember from your previous notes, that means I take X and Y and I make them both negative, but I leave them in the same order. So negative X, Y. So let's find out what N is originally first. N is at 2, negative 3. So 2, negative 3. So my new N is the same order, but I have to change the signs on both of them. So since 2 is positive here, I'm going to make it negative right here. And since 3 is negative here, I'm going to make it positive. That's what negative X, negative Y means. You can think of the negative in front of it as saying the opposite of x. So since it's positive, we make it negative. Since it's negative, we make it positive. Okay, and we can see where that looks like. That's negative 2, positive 3 is right there. Okay, let's try it with p. p is at 4, negative 8. So 4, negative 8. Same thing, I just change the signs when it's 180 degree rotation. So it's going to be negative 4, positive 8. Negative 4, positive 8. And if I draw that, I go negative 4, positive 8. Now if I were to all of a sudden get a point down here or something when I was checking it, I would know that I probably did something wrong because 180 degree rotation should end up over here in this coordinate. Okay, m is at 2, negative 8, 2, negative 8. So if I rotate that 180 degrees, I'm going to have negative 2, positive 8. So I go negative 2, positive 8. That's my new m. And by the way, we should have put prime on all of these. And I can draw my new triangle. It looks like I rotated 180 degrees as well, so that's probably a good idea that I probably did it right. So number five, reflect the 
it says trapezoid, but this is obviously not trapezoid. It's a triangle. Reflect the triangle. We'll just change that so it doesn't bug us. Reflect the triangle. HJKL over the x, the y-axis. Now, obviously, it's triangle ABC, right? Over the y-axis. We just wanted to trick you, make you confused at home. It's what math teachers like to do. All right, so here's our y-axis. If we're reflecting, our points stay on the same line. We just reflect it over the y-axis. So A, if we look at how far away it is from the y-axis, it's at negative 9 right here. Okay. So if I come to the y-axis, I'm going to go positive 9 this way and put my point right there. There's my new A prime. So the point for that is at 9, 7. Okay, B prime, the distance from the y-axis is negative 5 right here. So I come straight across on the same line and I go positive 5. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. There's my new B prime, and that is at 5, 9. Okay, my C is negative 5 away from the y-axis, so I go 5 this way. There's my new C, and that is at 5, 2. And once I find my points, I look at it, it looks like it's a reflection, so that's a good indication that I'm on the right track. I probably did, my, did it right. Okay, number six. Identify the transformation used to create triangle XYZ in each coordinate plane. So this is a reflection. If we look at B, it's 3 away from the x-axis. We check x, it's also 3 away, the distance. A is up 7, Z is down 7, and C is up 3, Y is down 3. So this is a reflection. Reflection over the x-axis. Okay, number seven. The first indication I have of what type of transformation this is is that this one is facing right side up, and so is this one. So it's a rigid transformation. I didn't rotate, I didn't spin it, I didn't reflect it, and it's not bigger or smaller, which is dilation. Translation just means I take the whole object and I move it. So it looks like it's a, we know it's a translation. We look at each point. X goes over 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So it goes right 5. Okay, right 5 units. And then from there we went down 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. So down 11. My eyes are hard to see that, so I hope I counted that right. Okay, number 8. <laughs> 8 and 9, determine the coordinates of each image without graphing. Okay, so the vertices of triangle RST are R03, S27, and T is at... 3, negative 1. I know we don't have quite enough room to see this whole problem. I can try to zoom out here other way. See if I can get the whole thing to show. Okay. Translate the triangle 5 units left and 3 units up from R prime, S prime, T prime. So if I'm going 5 units left when I have my coordinate plane, I'm going that way, which is negative on my x-axis. And 3 units up means I'm going to go positive in the y direction. So I'm going to subtract 5 from each of my x's and add 3 to each of my y's. So r is 0, 3. So x, if I add 5 to that, my new r prime would be 5, and my new x, or y, excuse me, is going to be, if I'm going up 3, I have to add 3 so it's going to be 6. S 
prime. I got to add, subtract. Excuse me, this was negative right here. Someone should have told me I messed that up. Okay, because I want left five units, so that's negative five. Okay, so if I have to subtract five from two, that gives me a negative three. And then I have to add three to seven, which gives me ten. T prime, subtract five from three, and I get negative two. Add three to negative one, and I get a positive two. So those would be my new units without graphing. Okay, nine, we've got to do the same thing. So we have a quadrilateral, W, X, Y, Z, and here's the points. We need to rotate it 90 degrees counterclockwise. From our notes before a 90 degree rotation, I have to switch my X and Y places. So if I start out with X, Y as my normal points, I trade places with them, and then I make the first number negative. That's what this means. Okay, so if I have my points, W is negative 10, 8. My new W, I have to trade places, so I'm going to put 8 first, and then 10 second. The sign of my first one, I change, and then the second one stays the same. So it was negative 10, so I'm going to keep it at negative 10. Okay, X prime, same thing. It's negative 2 and negative 1. Negative 2 and negative 1. So I switch places and I go 1 and 2. And then the signs, I make the first one opposite. So it was negative, so change it to positive. My second number stays the same sign, so I'm going to keep it at negative. Okay, y prime is 0, 0. So if I change places with 0, 0, nothing happens. And 0 is Neg not either negative or positive, so I just leave it. It's still at 0, 0 if I rotate it 90 degrees. And then Z prime, 3 and 7, so I'm going to switch places, put 7 and 3, change the sign of the first one, keep the sign of the second number. So that would be how I rotate that 90 degrees. Okay, number 10. Determine if the given pair of triangles are congruent by finding the length of each side. All right, so this is distance formula written all over it. But the nice thing is, is two of them lie on an axis, so I can just count them. The distance from A to B can just be counted right here. It's one, two, three units. So I'm just going to write three rather than go through and do the distance formula six times, which would make this video a year long and you'd all quit on me anyway. I'm just going to count it. Okay, and it's okay to do that on the test as well. DE is one, two, three units as well. Okay, A to C goes one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And then D to F or F to D, either way, is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So, so far I have side, those two sides, and these two sides, okay? And I have to determine if the triangles are congruent. Now, I want you to notice that on these two, this is a right angle, and so is this. Now, I can determine that from the picture because this goes straight up and down, and this goes horizontal, so it has to be a right angle. So I really could prove this already by side angle side theorem. But since the instructions say to find the length, to determine by finding the length, we have to go through the trouble of doing the distance formula on the last two sides. So to do that, let's find C is at 9, 4. So I'm going to write 9, 4. And I know you guys groan when you do the distance formula because it seems like a lot of work. Sometimes I do too. Don't love doing it, but we have to do it when we're asked. So 2, 7 is B. Okay, and my distance formula, make sure you know this for the test, is the square root of, I'm going to fill these in really quick. Okay, I have to subtract my x's, a plus sign in the middle, subtract my y's. Okay, so my x's are 2 and 9. 
so I'm going to go 2 minus 9. It doesn't matter which one I do first. <coughs> Since I started with this 2, I'm going to start with my this y. So 7 minus 4. Okay, 2 minus 9 is negative 7 plus, and I have to square that, plus 7 minus 4 is 3 squared. Anytime I square a negative number, negative 7 times negative 7 gives me a positive 49. 3 squared is 9. So this one is the square root of 58. The instructions do not say that we need to uh, keep that in the form of a decimal or a square root. We can try to break it down, but just for this, I'm just going to leave it at square root of 58 and see if we get the same thing with EF. We'll probably reduce that down, but for the sake of time, we'll leave it right there. Okay, EF, so this one was BC. Let's find the length from E to F. So we have the square root of... Leave our little blanks here. Then I subtract my x's here, subtract my y's here. So e is at 8, negative 6. f is at 1, negative 3. So my x is first, 1 minus 8. Then my y's, negative 3 minus 6, minus a negative 6. Okay. So let's simplify this. 1 minus 8 is negative 7 squared plus negative 3 minus a negative 6 is the same as adding 6. So negative 3 plus 6 is a positive 3 squared. We notice right here our steps are identical. So we'll not even have to do anything else to simplify. We get square root of 58. So I'm just going to leave it square root of 58. And that's enough to show that the two triangles are congruent, so the answer is yes. How was the figure ABC transformed? It was, if we look at it, we know it's not a reflection, right? Because then uh, we'd have A the same distance here from the x-axis and B. That's not true. It's not facing the same direction, so it can't be a translation. They're the same size, so it can't be a dilation. So the last thing we have is a rotation and it rotates 270 degrees to get into the third quadrant. So it's a 270 degree rotation. Okay, number 11. This is doing the same thing as number 10. So I'm not going to redo this one on the video. But you're going to find the distances. So the very first one you can count on those two. And then you can use the distance formula to find this distance and this distance, this distance and this distance, and see if they're all the same. I'd recommend you still practice that, even though I'm not going to do it on the video. And then the transformation, what happened there, this is a 180 degree rotation. It's not a rigid motion, so it's not a trans translation. Um, not a reflection over the x or y axis. And um, anyway, so it's a rotation here, 180 degrees into this quadrant. Okay, number 12. State the congruency theorem that could be used to prove the triangles in each figure are congruent. So we have an angle and a side, but we know that's not enough. But we have this other angle right here that's vertical. So we can mark those two angles as congruent which gives us angle, side, angle. When you check angle, side, angle, or one of the congruency theorems, you start in one triangle and see what you have. So you can't go like angle, angle, side, because you use two triangles. So pretend like this one's not here. Sorry, all I have is my phone for a second next to me. Block that one off. And we have angle, side, angle. There. Okay, number 13. They share this side, so if we were writing a proof, which it doesn't ask us to do, but if we were, we'd have to use the reflexive property to say that that side is congruent to itself. And start in one triangle 
and then move to the other one. I found a better blocker here. We have side, side, side. So we're going to use side, side, side. Okay, on number 14, we're going to have, this is a right triangle. They both have a right angle here, and then we have hypotenuse leg. So we can say this is congruent by hypotenuse leg theorem. Okay, on number 15, given triangle ABC is congruent to DEF, so it tells us that they are congruent, we need to find all these missing measurements, okay? So we have angle D is the first one that we need to find. So, oh, sorry, lost my... Oh, wonder what's going on there. Okay, I think we got it fixed now. All right, if we look at this, this is the thing I always like to look at. This means A is congruent to D, because they're both first here, because order matters. So I'm going to say A is the same as D. B is congruent to E. So B, right here we'll put two lines, is congruent to E. Now notice it's not a 90 degree angle. It says it's 91, so even though it looks like it is, it's not. We can't assume. And that's supposed to have two lines instead of one. It's kind of scribbled, sorry. C is congruent to F. So C will do three lines. It's congruent to F. Okay, so that kind of answers a lot of questions for us. First of all, angle D is the same as angle A. I'm going to have to grab my calculator out here. See if I have one by me. Hold on! Find it. That's what happens when you're not prepared. All right. So angle A, we know that these three angles have to add up to 180. So 91 plus 65 gives me 156. And I take 180, subtract 156 to find what's left over right here. and it's 24. So angle A is 24. Ask for that right here. Okay, angle D is the same as angle A. They correspond, so it's also 24. Angle F is the same as angle C, so it's 65. CB, this side length is the same as EF, so it's 8. AC is the same as DF, so it's 30. And DE is the same as AB, so it's 35. So this one was just recognizing. Um, the only math I had to do was a simple subtraction problem. The rest of it was just recognizing the theorems and what congruency means. Okay, 16. So on this one, we need to find X, Y, Z, W, and A, B. So it says A, B, C is congruent to W, Y, Z. So that means angle A is congruent to angle W. So I can go like this. Angle B is congruent to angle Y. So we can go like this. And angle C is congruent to angle Z. Okay, this also means that side AB is congruent to WY. So AB is congruent to WY. BC is congruent to YZ. And then AC is congruent to ZW. Now I'm looking for a value that, a side that um, has a value over here and over here so I can make them equal to each other. So if I have AB is congruent to YW, that means that those two side lengths are the same. They equal each other. So this side length is 2Y minus 1. So even though it doesn't say a number, that's still the, what represents the side length. And this side length has to be Y plus 8. And I have to solve for Y, so I'm going to subtract Y from both sides. 
And then in the same motion, I hope this doesn't bug anyone if I do this to save a little room, I can add one to the other side. So I get 2y minus y is y equals 9. So y equals 9. I'll have that one. Now 2x minus 3. This side right here corresponds with this one. So I can say 2x minus 3 equals 25. Let's do that over here. 2x minus 3 equals 25. So I can add 3 to both sides. 2x equals 28. Divide by 2 on both sides and x equals 14. Okay, the length of ZW, that one we have to plug in what we found out for X. And this says it's 2 times X, which would mean 2 times 14, so ZW is 28. And then AB, we have to plug Y in to find the length of AB, so 2 times 9 is 18, minus 1 is 17. Okay, number 17, use the triangle at the right to find x and the measure of angle B. Okay, so x, this is an isosceles triangle. We know that because both those sides are congruent. So if I have those two sides congruent, I can set them equal to each other. So 3x plus 12 equals 5x minus 46. I can subtract 5x from both sides, and in the same breath, subtract 12 from both sides. And on this side, I get 3 minus 5 is negative 2x equals negative 46 minus 12 is a negative 58. Divide both sides by negative 2, so I'm going to get a positive answer. 58 divided by 2 is a positive 29. So x is 29. Angle B, now, all three of these angles have to add up to be 180, and I know these two have to be the same because of the isosceles angle base theorem, that these two are the same. So 72 plus 72 is 144, and 180 minus 144 is 36. So angle B is 36. Okay, 18. Find the missing sides of each triangle. Leave answers in reduced radical form, so I don't want to decimal here. So we first have to recognize this is a special triangle. The way I know that is this is 90 and that's 45. So this angle also has to be 45. That makes it a 45, 45, 90 triangle. In that, the, we know the two legs are the same. So x has to equal 6 square root of 2. When I go from the leg to the hypotenuse, I have to times by the square root of 2 because I'm getting bigger. So I'm going to multiply. So 6 times the square root of 2, if I times that by the square root of 2, I get 6 square root of 4, and I know the square root of 4 is just 2. So in the end, I get 6 times 2 equals 12. So y is 12. Okay, b. This one can also be a special triangle because these two lengths are both represented by A. That means they're the same. So that means this has to be a 45, 45, 90 triangle. So when I do that, I have my hypotenuse. And I'm going to the side, which is smaller. So I divide by square root of 2. So this would be 10 divided by the square root of 2. I have to rationalize the denominator. So times by the square root of 2 over the square root of 2. And then I get 10 square root of 2 over 2. And then 10 divided by 2 equals 5 square root of 2. C, I have to recognize that this is a 30, 60, 90 triangle. My 30 degree is across from x, so this is my short leg. Y is across from my 90 degree angle, so this is my hypotenuse. So I need to go from the long leg to the short leg. So I'm getting smaller, so I've got to divide by the square root of 3. So 3, square root of 3, divided by the square root of 3, those two cancel, and my short leg is just 3. So x is 3. To go from my short leg to my hypotenuse, I multiply it by 2, so y equals 6. Put that right here. I'm running out of room. Sorry. Okay, d. 
is also a 30, 60, 90 triangle. So cross from the 30 is my short leg, cross from the 60 is my long leg, cross from the 90 is my hypotenuse. So I go, I'm also, again, going long leg to short leg. That means I divide by the square root of 3. So 9 divided by the square root of 3 equals 9 square root of 3 over 3, and that equals 3 square root of 3 right here. And then when I'm going short leg to hypotenuse, I times it by 2, so 6 square root of 3. Last page, yay! Oh, oh, there we go, okay. Create a two-column proof to prove that triangle ABC is congruent to ECD. Okay, so the very first thing I do, I need a statement column, and I need a reasons column. My first couple of reasons are always going to be my givens, and when you have just a picture as your only given, then the markings on the diagram are your givens. So I can say first, angle A is congruent to angle E. That's my first statement. And my reason is given. The second statement can be AC is congruent to EC. AC is congruent to EC, and that is also given. Okay, and the third step is one I have to recognize myself. It's not given anymore. So we look up here and we can say, do we have any sides that they share? And we don't have any. But the one thing we can see is we have a vertical angle right here. And remember, we can't just say angle C is congruent to angle C because there's four angle C's here. So I have to do it with three points. I can say A, C, B, angle A, C, B is congruent to angle E, C, D by the vertical angles theorem. I'll just put vertical A. You know what I'm talking about. Okay, and then the very last thing is our prove statement. This statement right here always belongs as our last step. So triangle A, B, C is congruent to triangle ECB, and that is by angle side angle. Okay, number 20, I'm not proving that two triangles are congruent to each other, I'm trying to prove two angles. So I'm going to have to use that CPCTC theorem, the corresponding parts of congruent triangles are congruent, to prove this. But remember, before I can use that reason, I have to prove the two triangles are congruent first. So we have to do our statements and reasons. Okay, statements, reasons. Try to write fast. Okay, statement one, we can look at our givens. EC is congruent to AC. EC is congruent to AC, and that reason is given. Okay, the other given is DC is congruent to BC. DC is congruent to BC. That is given. We can recognize we have a vertical angle here again. So we can't say angle C is congruent to angle C, but I can say ACB. So angle ACB is congruent to angle DCE by the vertical angles. I'm just going to put VA. Fourth step is I can prove that triangle ACB, triangle ACB is congruent to ECD triangle by side angle side. Once I've proven that, now I can say that angle A is congruent to angle E because corresponding parts of congruent triangles are congruent. So A and E will also be congruent because I proved that the two triangles are congruent to each other. Okay, I'm going to skip 21 for the sake of time. Um, let's go to 22. Calculate the distance and midpoint. Okay, so distance formula is square root. We draw our little diagram here and then fill in the blanks x minus x, so negative 6 minus 5. 
and then 4 minus a negative 1. So negative 6 minus 5 makes negative 11 squared plus 4 minus a negative 1 is the same as adding 1, so that would be 5 squared. 11, negative 11 squared is a positive 121 plus 25 is 5 squared. And this equals the square root of 146. If I were to find that as a decimal, I would get 12.08 or 12.1, depending on how you wanted to round that. Okay, midpoint, I just add my x's and divide by 2, and then add my y's and divide by 2. So negative 6 plus 5 divided by 2 will give me my x-coordinate. 4 plus a negative 1 is the same as 4 minus 1 divided by 2 gives me my y. So negative 6 plus 5 is negative 1 over 2 is negative 1 half. 4 minus 1 is 3. 3 over 2 is 3 halves. We just leave it just like that. That's my midpoint. 23. Write the equation of the line that passes through the point. So first I have to find the slope. But before I even do that, remember that if I have this y is negative 5 and this y is negative 5, that's enough to tell me that that's a horizontal line. If I were to graph that, I'd have positive 3 and then down 5. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 right here. Then I'd have negative 4. 1, 2, 3, 4 and also down 5. So no matter what x I choose, y is always going to be negative 5. So it's just a horizontal line at y equals negative 5. It's a lot less work. Then finding the slope, plugging it in, finding that b, where b is, and all that. So this is a little bit easier. 24. Write the equation of the line that passes through the points. Negative 1, 4, 5, negative 3. My x's are different and my y's are different, so I know I have to find the slope. Slope formula is y1 minus y2 over x1 minus x2. You could also, it doesn't matter if I go y2 minus y1 as long as I start x2 minus x1. Okay? I always tell my students to stack their points. So I'm going to take those points and I'm going to put them right underneath this one. That way I can just subtract from the top to bottom. So 4 minus a negative 3 on top over negative five, 1 minus 5. This is the same as 4 plus 3, so that's 7. Negative 1 minus 5 is negative 6. So that's my slope. This is going to be a fun one. Okay, so then I have to go y equals mx plus b. I'm trying to find b. I can substitute an x and a y in and a slope. I need a little bit more room, so I'm going to come up here. I'm going to use this y, so 4 equals negative 7 6 times a negative 1 is my x plus b. Okay, I'm going to change this to decimals just for the sake of time. So negative 7 6 times a negative 1 is a positive 7 6. And 7 6 is 1.11, 1 1.1667. Okay, so 4 equals 1.1667 plus b. Okay, I can subtract that from both sides. And using a calculator, it makes it kind of easy. 2.8333, and I can use the button on my calculator to change that to a fraction. And I get 17.6. I kind of use the cheating way for sake of time and for not making this video too long because we're already at 40 minutes. Okay, and you have a calculator and you have access to that, so use it for the test. So y equals negative 7, 6, x plus 17, 6. That's going to be my answer for 24. Okay, 25. Given FB is a mid-segment and FB is parallel to EC, Find the following. Okay, so this means it doesn't look like it, but it says it's the mid-segment. Mid that means F divides this line in half 
and B divides this line in half. Definitely does not look like it, but we have to go with what we're told. Okay, so AF, if F is the mid-segment, then AF has to be 9, because this distance is 9. And if F cuts it in half, then this one's the same. So this is 9. BC, B is the mid-segment of this line, so that means BC has to be 11. And FB, the, remember that theorem that said if I connect the mid-segments of each side, it is going to be half the length of the base. So since this is 20, this is 10. Okay, I hope that helps you be ready for the test. And thanks for st staying tuned for 40 minutes, long time.